Hello all, so welcome to our uh, current affairs roundup where we are covering uh, the January to March 2023 current affairs and this is the part 1 of GS2 current affairs. The first topic under it is Vibrant Village Program. So in the infographics here you can see that the cabinet has approved the centrally sponsored scheme that is Vibrant Village Programs for the financial year 2022-23 to 2025-26. So the total financial allocation of the scheme is for 800 crore. This will lead to the infrastructure development and livelihood opportunities in four states and one union territory along the northern land border. So please understand here, this is concentrating on the villages and mainly for infrastructure development and also livelihood opportunities. You should remember four states one union territory and this is going to be in the northern law land border. So let's see a detail about this. Uh, union Home Minister had urged the border guarding forces to make use of this vibrant villages program for permanent security in border villages. See these border villages are becoming a concern for India. Uh, for your uh, revision i'm telling you india is having borders with pakistan china nepal sorry nepal and uh, bhutan and bangladesh and also myanmar so though uh, we don't have any problems with bhutan uh, and also bangladesh and myanmar but we have a very much problem with china especially in the borders okay so uh, now the union home minister has told this border guarding forces to make use of this vibrant village program to develop the infrastructure there and also develop uh, or improve the livelihood opportunities in the border villages so let's look at this vibrant village program it was announced in the finance minister's budget speech of 2022 that is last year the program envisages coverage of border villages please remember the border villages on the northern border in states like himachal pradesh uttarakhand and arunachal pradesh so if you can observe here all this all these three states have border with China. So China, China is very much a threat to India. So we have very difficult relationship with them. So to develop the border villages, they have given a call for this vibrant villages program. So these villages along India's border with China have a sparse population, limited connectivity and infrastructure. So with if these sparse population are given better livelihood opportunities and the limited connectivity and infrastructure are being developed, then this will help the people to have positive environment or attitude towards the country. This program is meant to improve the infrastructure in the villages which is often get left out of the development gains. Also, there, were, there are certain advantages with this vibrant village program. So, see here in the infographics, I have covered that these border villages have sparse population, limited connectivity and infra and usually they are getting left out. Such villages will be covered under a new vibrant villages program. The activities will include construction of infra, housing, tourist centers, road connectivity and support for their livelihood generation. So additional funding for these activities will be provided. So the advantages of this uh, vibrant village program are this can increase in tourism especially in the border villages. If you have seen the Three Idiots movie, the lake which has covered uh, the, uh, the climax scene is in the border village of Ladakh. 
So this will help in increasing the tourism in border villages. It can make villages self-sufficient and equipped with all facilities. So since it is targeting for uh, livelihood improvement, it will help in the villages to be self-sufficient and also be equipped with all facilities like infrastructure. This could help to stem the trend out uh, of out migration from the border areas on the Indian side and possibly reverse it in the future. Since they are sparsely populated, we don't want them to come out of that border areas and seek a future outside here because the border areas are very sensitive and we need our population stable in the border areas. Okay, The borders can be permanently secured with patriotic citizens of these populated border villages. So we don't want this past population to get out of that areas. So since 2017, China has undertaken large scale construction activity along the border with India and it has built hundreds of border villages in Tibet to strengthen their presence along the frontier. So to counter that, we have introduced this vibrant village program in four states and one union territory. Please, please remember, it is only for the north about border villages which are bordering China uh, and we want to develop the infrastructure and also make them self-sufficient with livelihood generation programs. The next important topic we are going to see here under GS2 is living wage. So this was a news because the government is mulling the shifting to living wage which is indexed to inflation from the existing minimum wages. Are you getting this? Instead of using minimum wages, we want to shift to living wages and this living wage will be indexed to inflation. Are you getting my point? Because each region has different kind of uh, needs and requirements and we used to pay the labor till now as minimum wage but we want to shift it to living wage and this living wage is indexed to inflation. So now we should understand what is living wage. This is a socially accepted level of income that provides adequate coverage, adequate coverage for basic necessities. For any person what is the basic necessities that is food, shelter, child services and health care. So this is the socially acceptable level of income and this will help in covering the, uh, the basic necessities of a human like food, shelter, child services and healthcare. So it is the remuneration which is received by a worker in a particular place. So here see uh, we have divided into five regions, region 1, region 2, region 3, region 4 and region 5. So see here in region 1, they need 342 rupees per day or 8892 per month. And in region 2, we need 380 rupees per day and 9880 per month. The region 3, 440 per day and 11622 per month. Region 4, 447 per day and 11622. Region 5 is... Uh, 386 per day and uh, uh, 10,036 per month. So region 1 comprises of Assam, Bihar, Jharkhand, MP, Odisha, UP and West Bengal. This is mainly the eastern part, eastern part, not the northeastern part, it is the eastern part. And the region 2 comprises of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Chhattisgarh, uh, uh, Rajasthan, Jammu, Kashmir and uh, Uttarakhand. Uh, the region 3 is Gujarat, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. And the region 4 is Delhi, Goa, uh, Himachal Pradesh, Ariana and Punjab. Region 5 is Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya, uh, Nagaland, Sikkim, Mizoram and Tripura. So region 5 is mainly the all states, uh, the seven sisters of the northeast. Okay, not the seven sisters because Assam is covered here in region 1. Except Assam, their other northeastern region are covered in region 5. So this is this wage, uh, uh, 
is given to the worker in a particular place sufficient to afford a decent standard of living for the worker and uh, her or his family. The elements of a decent standard of living include the basic needs which I have told here, food, shelter, child services and health care and other essential needs including provision for unexpected events. Next one. So, the living wage is different from the minimum wage. You should understand that this living wage is not the same as minimum wage, but the living wage is different than the minimum wage. The minimum wage is the lowest amount of money someone can earn as mandated by the law. This is the minimum. See, minimum itself says that it is the lowest amount of money someone can earn as mandated by law. The minimum wage does not provide enough in income to survive as it doesn't rise with inflation. Please remember the minimum wage minimum wage is not related to inflation but the living wage is related to inflation okay so another alternative to minimum wages is universal basic income so now we are going to switch from minimum wages to living wages and living wage is really or uh, connected to inflation while minimum wage is not connection connected to inflation the next important topic is Asian Pacific Postal Union. So the news was that India is going to take over the leadership of Asian Pacific Postal Unit APPU and Dr. Vinaya Prakash Singh will take over the charge of the Secretary General of the Union for a tenure of four years. So this is this makes the topic very important. So you should understand that this is the first time an Indian is leading an international organization in the postal sector and this topic becomes important for the same reason. So what is this Asian Pacific Postal Union simply called as APPU? This is an intergovernmental organization. Please remember this is an intergovernmental organization. It is a member of 32 countries of this Asia Pacific region. This is only covering the Asia Pacific region and you have 32 countries being the member of this Asia Pacific region uh, postal union. So this is headquartered in Bangkok, Thailand. This is only restricted union of the Universal Postal Union in the region and this is a specialized a agency of the United Nations. So this is a specialized U uh, agency of United Nations. This point is very very important. From here to here you, you should know uh, in detail. So it is an uh, intergovernmental organization. It is comprising of 32 countries of the Asian Pacific region. The headquarters is in Bangkok, Thailand and it is also so a specialized agency of the United Nations. Now the goal of this Asian Pacific Postal Union is to extend, facilitate and improve postal relations between the member countries and promote cooperation in the field of postal services. APPU is the regional center for various UPU projects and this ensures that the region is integrated into the global postal network in the best possible way by fulfilling the UPU projects in the region. So the Secretary General leads the activities of the Union. Secretary General is also the Director of the Asian Pacific Postal College. The next important article is about Article 19. So this is about right to life. It, the news was that the Supreme Court said the fundamental rights under Article 19 and 21 of the Constitution can be enforced against private individuals and entities. So please understand uh, the Supreme Court has told that these fundamental rights can be enforced against private individuals and entities and this makes the topic important. So Article 19 is a fundamental right which gives the guarantee of freedom of speech and expression uh, generally invoked against the state. 
the right of free speech and expression guaranteed under the article 191a cannot be curbed by any additional grounds other than those already laid down in article 192 the ruling extended the ambit of the fundamental rights with a horizontal approach a vertical application of rights would mean it can be enforced only against the state while a horizontal approach would mean it is enforceable against other citizens so horizontal approach is different while vertical application is different so vertical application means it can be enforced only against the state horizontal means it is against other citizen also so vertical means only against the state horizontal means it is against other citizens also okay so this is the protection of certain rights given uh, regarding the freedom of speech etc all citizens have this right that is freedom to speech and expression nothing in the sub clause of clause 1 shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law in so far as such law imposes reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right conferred by the said sub clause in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of of india and the security of the state friendly relations with the foreign states public order decency or morality or in relation to the content of code defamation or incitement to an offense so the five judge bench of unanimous view that state bound duty bound to protect the right to life wherever there is a threat from any quarter including private persons so vertical is also applied against the state but it's also applied horizontally against other citizens so the majority verdict says that fundamental fundamental right to free speech and life can be enforced against private persons other than state or its instrumentalities in dissenting verdict justice nagaratna says except of except for abs corpus produce right to free speech and life cannot be enforced against persons other than state so the majority verdict says mere statements of a mere statement are due to violation of constitutional rights and hence not actionable for award of compensation so this makes the article uh, very very important so the next thing you have to know is that the sc has ruled that uh, article 19 or 21 can be enforced even against persons other than the state or its instrumentalities the court extends the free speech against private citizens opens up a range of possibilities in the constitutional law example is a horizontal application of the right to life would enable a citizen to bring a case against a private entity for causing pollution which would be a violation of the right to a clean environment next is about women un peacekeepers so there is a uh, tension happening in sudan uh, so you should uh, read about this so india is set to deploy india's largest single unit of women peacekeepers as part of a battalion to the united nations interim security force in abe Abe is in the border region of North Sudan and South Sudan and the tension is happening here the indian contingent comprising of two officers and 25 other ranks will form part of an engagement platoon and specialize in community outreach the team will be deployed as part of a battalion to the united nations interim security force in abe and this is this abe is on the border between south sudan and sudan and the the contingent will remain deployed in abe for a period of 6 months the team will provide relief and assistance to women and children in one of the most challenging terrains under the un flag and uh, this is india's largest single unit of women peacekeepers in a un mission so india has deployed the first ever all women's contingent from the central reserve police force in liberia in 
2007 as part of United Nations mission in Liberia, women peacekeepers are highly regarded for their ability to reach out and connect with women and children in the local population, especially the victims of sexual violence in the conflict zones. So please remember about this UN peacekeeping mission. It is a joint effort between the UN Department of Peace Operations and the Department of Operational Support. It aims to assist host countries to transition from situations or uh, conflict to peace. The UN began its peacekeeping efforts in 1948 when it deployed military observers to West Asia. The UN peacekeepers provide security as well as political and peace building support to conflict ridden countries. India is one of the largest troop contributing nations to UN peacekeeping mission. So this is very very important particularly this area. It is between Sudan and South Sudan. Next is about Y20 summit. The Youth Affairs and Sports Minister launched the themes of the Y20 Summit logo and website in the curtain raiser event of Y20 Summit India. So, Youth 20 or Y20 is the official youth engagement group of G20. You all know that G20 is happening in India this year and India is the president for it. Okay? It provides a platform that allows youth to express their vision and also ideas on the G20 priorities and India is hosting this Youth 20 Summit for the first time. The activities to be undertaken by Y20 during India's presidency will focus on global youth leadership and partnership. So which are the five themes of uh, Youth 20? The future of work, industry 4.0, innovation and 21st century skills, climate change and disaster risk reduction, uh, making sustainability a way of life, peace building and reconciliation, ushering in an era of no war, shared future, youth and democracy and governance and health, well-being and sports, an agenda for youth. In a run-up for the final Youth 20 Summit for the next eight months, there will be pre-summits and on the five Y20 themes. Eat Right Schools Initiative so who can apply here? Institutions, colleges, universities, hospitals, jails, tea estates, workplaces, others. So it is a certification progress and food service establishments in the campus should be licensed and registered under the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. And there will be four audit parameters that is eat safe, eat healthy, eat sustainable and build awareness. So Chandigarh has implemented this Eat Right School initiative and it is focusing on 100 government schools in the first phase of this initiative. What is this Eat Right School? It was launched by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, FSSAI, as a part of Eat Right India movement. The aim was to create awareness about food safety, nutrition and hygiene among school children and through them among the community at a large. So the plan is to assess the quality of food served in canteens and replace them with a healthy and nutritious diet. And it is designed to deliver and reinforce the message of safe and nutritious food through both curricular and co-curricular activities. An Eat Right Matrix is a monitoring and evaluation tool. It is developed for the schools to be certified as Eat Right School. It also ensures an enabling legislative and regulatory in government and private schools across the country. So the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, FSSAI, has been established under the Food Safety and Secure, uh, Standards Act of 2006 and it comes under the admin, uh, administrative control of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It enforces various provisions of the 2006 Act, this is the Act, to establish a single reference point for all matters relating to food safety and standards. Title 42 and uh, Principle of non refoulement So it was a news because the United States announced that it will extend Title 42 to expel the migrants caught crossing the US-Mexico border back to Mexico. 
So Title 42 dates back to 1944 law known as the Public Health Services Act which was grant which granted US health authorities emergency powers to prevent the spread of diseases. So in March 2020 Trump administration invoked this Title 42 and uh, they stated the intent of preventing COVID-19 from spreading in the U.S. So Title 42 allowed the administration of the United States, especially uh, the uh, health authorities, to quickly expel migrants trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border without clearance, including asylum seekers. These measures under Title 42 appear to be at variance with the prohibition of collective expulsion and the principle of non-refoulement. So what is this principle of non refoulement It is guaranteed under the international human rights law. And this international principle of non refoulement guarantees that no one should be returned to a country where they would face torture, cruelty, inhuman or this degrading treatment or punishment. And it applies to all migrants at all times irrespective of the migration status. Curative Petition The concept of curative petition was first evolved by the Supreme Court of India in the matter of Rupa Ashok Hara and Rupa Ashok Hura um, and ANR. So this power can be exercised by the Supreme Court in order to prevent abuse of its process and to cure gross miscarriage of justice. The curative petition entitles the aggrieved person to certain relief against a final judgment of the Supreme Court after dismissal of review petition either under Article 32 or otherwise. The concept of a curative petition is an extra constitutional judicial device to cure gross miscarriage of justice and abuse of process. So it is not to be heard in open court unless specifically directed and the same bench which passed the review order hears it generally as far as possible. So it was a news because the constitution bench of the Supreme Court made it clear to the government that it will not try the curative petition of the center like a suit the Bhopal gas leak tragedy case. So what is this curative Petition, it may be filed after a review plea against the final conviction is dismissed. So it is meant it is meant to ensure that there is no miscarriage of justice and to prevent abuse of the process. So this curative petition petition is usually decided by the judges in chamber unless a specific request for an open court hearing is allowed. The curative jurisdiction is a rare remedy evolved by a constitution bench of the Supreme Court in 2002 in Ashok Hurra versus Rupa Hurra case. So this. The curative petition can be filed in the Supreme Court by elucidating the scope of curative nature of power conferred on the Supreme Court under Article 142 and the power to review judgment pronounced or order made by the Supreme Court under Article 137. So every curative petition is decided on the basis of principles laid down by this case. The court ruled that a curative petition can be entertained if the petitioner establishes there is a violation of principles of natural justice. He was not heard by the court before passing an order. It will also be admitted where a judge failed to disclose facts that raise the apprehension of bias. So the criteria is uh, there must be rare rather than regular and be entertained with caution. A curative petition must be accompanied by a certification by a senior advocate pointing out substantial grounds for entertaining it and it must be first circulated to a bench of three senior most judges and judges who pass the concerned judgment if available. So only a majority of the judges conclude that the matter needs hearing. It should be listed as far as possible before the same bench. The Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for TTP, that is CPTPP. So who's in it? Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and Mexico. Who's yet to ratify it? Brunei, Malaysia, Peru and Chile. So what is this Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership Commission? This is an uh, this is an access and ne accession negotiations with the United Kingdom, and this is a free trade agreement between eleven countries in the Asia Pacific 
nation so please remember india is not a part of this uh, cptpp so the agreement will lower the tariffs and other trade barriers among the 11 countries so the tpp 11 countries are australia brunei canada chile japan malaysia mexico new zealand peru Singapore and Vietnam. So CPTPP entered into force on December 30, 2018 with six countries to have ratified the agreement that is Canada, Australia, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand and Singapore. So for other signatories, the CPTPP will enter into force 60 days after their ratification. And this there is a commission uh, of CPTPP, which is a decision making body of the group. The agreement is a separate treaty that incorporates by reference a majority of the provisions of the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement. It is signed but yet not enforced. The CPTPP preserves the ambitious scope and high quality standards and rules of the original TPP. It includes an accession process that provides for further expansion of the agreement's membership. Any economy that is able to meet the high standard rules and ambitious market access commitments of the CPTPP can seek to join the agreement and it is subjected to negotiations on terms and conditions with the current CPTPP members. Though China is a Pacific Rim country, it is not a part of this TPP but part of regional comprehensive economic partnership which is viewed as an alternative to TPP. So please remember India is not a part of this. CPTPP and China is also not a part of this but China is a part of this RCEP. ACER report of 2022. So it has said the proportion of children in the government schools up is up from 65.6% .6 in 2018 to 79.29% in 2022. Children taking private pay tuitions up from 26.4 in uh, 2018 to 30.5 in 2022. So regarding the levels down to pre-2012 levels, only 20.5 children in class 3 can read a class 2 textbook is down from 27.3% in 2018. So the enrollment in 6 to 14 age group is recorded at a high of 68.4% children now enrolled in school up to uh, from 97.2% in 2018. So the 17th annual status of education report simply called ASA uh, was released by NGO Pratham after four years. This annual status of education report ASA is a household survey conducted for children in the age group of 3 to 16 years. So it is a household survey and for children between 3 to 16 years to record their schooling status and access their basic reading and arithmetic skills this point is very important it is a household survey children between 3 to 16 years and we are going to assess this their basic reading and arithmetic skills the 17th acer covers uh, 616 rural districts and covers 6.9 lakh children in the age group of 3 to 6 years the report is being brought out after four years due to covid 19 pandemic and this is brought by ngo pratham so it is not a government one it is a uh, it is by ngo pratham it uh, the records uh, impact of school closures in uh, 2020 and 2021 as well as a return to school of children uh, in 2022 so the government school saw a sharp rise in enrollment for the first time in 16 years. The basic literary levels of children, especially reading ability as compared to numerical skills, has worsened much more sharply and dropping to pre-2020. 12 levels. The level of percentage of girls who were out of school 11 to 14 years of age group declined from 2% from declined to 2% from 4.1%. The proportion of girls between 15 to 16 years age group not enrolled to school has decreased uh, from 7 to 7.9% in 2022 from 13.5% in 2018. The Voice of Global South Summit. A summit. So India has launched this virtual conference of the first ever Voice of Global South Summit. So this Global South refers to the developing and the less developed countries of the world. The Voice of the Global 
uh, South Summit under the theme of unity of voice, unity of purpose was held virtually for two days and this is an opportunity for non-G20 countries to share their ideas and expectations with the G20. It envisages bringing together countries on the of the global south to share their perspectives and priorities on the common platform. The inputs from the summit will be channeled into the deliberations of the G20. So a total of 125 nations took part in a digital conference and it comprised of 10 sessions. Besides Besides the two leader sessions, eight ministerial level thematic sessions were also held. Prime Minister Modi also announced five new initiatives by India in the summit that is, Arogya Maitri, Wellness Friendship, Global South Center of Excellence, Global South Science and Technology Initiative, Global South Young Diplomats Forum, Global South Scholarships. Low Court Committee, the Office of the Registrar General of India, um, is following this set of criteria set out by the low low court committee to define any new community as a scheduled tribe so as per the procedure for the scheduled tribes the office of the registrar general of india nod is mandatory for the inclusion of any community in the st list so please understand so uh, the registrar general of india is the main main authority who is going to mandate or give a nod to inclusion of any tribe uh, as st for defining the community as a tribe the office of the registrar general of india consults the criteria laid out by the local committee report of 1965 the advisory committee on on the revision of the list of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes is also known as local committee the criteria set out by the local committee for defining a community as a tribe are indications of primitive traits district culture, geographical isolation, shyness of contact with the community at large and backwardness. So the task force uh, in February 2014, the union government constituted a task force on the scheduling of tribes. Uh, issues identified, uh, the task force notes, noted the procedure is obsolete, cumbersome, uh, condensed uh, condense dating and um, follows a rigid and dogmatic approach. The task force also noted that this is hindering the inclusion of over 40 communities under the ST list across the country. Recommendation uh, the, uh, the, uh, the task force has recommended criteria to, uh, which are set out by the local, co local committee. And the task force came up with a new criteria, socio-economic, including educational backwardness and the rest of the population of the state, historical geographical uh, isolation, which may or may not exist today, distinct language or dialect, presence of a core culture relating to life cycle, marriage, songs, dance, paintings, folklore, endogamy or in case of exogamy, marital relationship primarily with other SDs. So permanent commission, sorry, your N has been missed out to women commission officers. So the Indian Army has begun the process for the selection of women officers for command postings in the rank of colonel. The Indian Army has guaranteed the permanent commission to women officers with an aim to provide equal opportunities to women. This flows from the Supreme Court judgment granting permanent commission as as well as commands posting to women officers in all arms and services other than combat. So in all arms and services other than combat, they are going to get a permanent commission. So what is this permanent commission? This is a career in the army until one retires. If one gets selected through the permanent commission, one has the option to serve the duty up to the full age of retirement. The induction of women officers in the army started in 1992 through women special entry scheme. Under the women special entry scheme, they were commissioned for a period of five years in the certain chosen streams uh, such as army education, corps, corps of engineers, etc. In 2006, the WSES, that is Women's Special Entry Scheme, was replaced with Short Service Commission Scheme under which they could serve only up to 40 years. What is this charge sheet? Why it is in use? Because the Supreme Court held that charge sheets are not public documents and denied their free public access. The charge sheet is a final report 
prepared by the police officer or investigative agencies after completing their investigation of a case as defined under section 173 of the CRPC. The officer in charge of the police station forwards the charge sheet to a magistrate. The charge sheet should contain details of the names, the nature of the information, offences and the status of the accused, arrested, released or forwarded in custody. The charge sheet is to be filed within 60 days from the date of arrest of the accused in cases tribal by local courts and 90 days in case tribal by court of sections. So failing to do so, the arrest is deemed illegal and accused is entitled to bail. So what is the distinction between FIR and a charge sheet? So FIR is a preliminary report while charge sheet is a final report. FIR is prepared by the victim of the crime, charge sheet is prepared by the investigation officer. FIR is, it is filed in a police station while charge sheet is filed in a court. FIR is having purpose of investigation and uh, charge sheet as a purpose of trail. FIR can be withdrawn in petty offences but charge sheet cannot be withdrawn. So zero FIR, another amendment which came after Nirbhaya case. In zero FIR, any police station can register FIR irrespective of the jurisdi jurisdictional area, but the investigation will be taken up by the police in the place of occurrence reported in the FIR. So, if you are in New Delhi and your uh, area of crime is Mukherjee Nagar and you are going, you, you can register even in Rajinder Nagar and the Rajinder Nagar police should take the FIR and it, and it should hand over to Mukherjee Nagar police station to uh, take up the charges. So this is the concept of zero FIR. It came after this Nirbhaya case. The SE rulings, it is not a public document under section 74 and 76 of the Evidence Act enabling free public access of charge sheets violates the provisions of CRPC as it comprises or, or compromises the right of accused victims and the investigation agencies. The court also held that copies of the charge sheet and the relevant document do not fall within section 41B of the RTI Act. Hybrid immunity. So, a recent study by the Lancet Infectious Diseases held that hybrid immunity provides better protection against severe COVID-19. The study said that a hybrid immunity offers a higher magnitude and durability of protection as compared to infection alone, emphasizing the need for vaccination. So, hybrid immunity is gained from a previous infection plus vaccines, either the primary doses or by primary and booster doses. So, a natural infection after vaccination acts like a booster and offers hybrid immunity. So, this infection provides better protection than vaccines alone because it prepares the body against the entire virus rather than say just a spike protein. So, individuals with hybrid immunity may be able to extend the period before booster vaccinations compared to individuals who have never been infected. What is this herbal herd immunity? So, it is the kind of protection that the population gets when it's become immune to an infection, be it through previous infections or vaccination, and thus the likelihood of infection for individuals who lack immunity gets reduced. So, here there is uh, here the hybrid commun immunity refers to a combination of natural infection with a single dose of vaccine. Several studies now show that hybrid immunity provides greater protection than natural infection without a vaccination or full vaccination alone. So fully vaccinated people with prior infection showed a steeper decline in neutralizing antibodies over the period of 3 to 7 months than those with a prior infection. The study published in Science observed that boosting of pre-existing immunity from prior infection uh, with vaccination mainly resulted in a transient benefit to antibody uh, titers with a little to no long term increase in the cellular immune memory. Okay, uh, the immunological advantage from hybrid immunity arises mostly from memory B cells which evolve in the lymph nodes. The bulk of antibodies after infection or vaccination decline after a short while. However, the memory B cells get triggered on subsequent infection or vaccination. So, about trans fat. What are these trans fatty acids? They are industrially produced trans fatty acids and are found in baked and 
fried foods, pre-packaged snacks, cooking oils. They cause less than the animal fats such as butter and increase the shelf lives of the foods and oils by lowering their oxidation potential. So the trans fatty acid is said to increase the risk of coronary heart diseases. Globally increased trans fatty acid intake is estimated to be responsible for 5 lakh deaths per year. And this increases the level of LDL, bad cholesterol and decreases the levels of HDL that is the good cholesterol. The survey of street food in Delhi and Haryana found that 25% of snacks had high levels of trans fatty acids. So a new status report from World Health Organization has found that 5 billion people globally remain unprotected from harmful trans fats. The trans fats or trans fatty acids are a form of unsaturated fat and it occurs both in natural and artificial forms. Naturally occurring trans fat comes from ruminants that is cows and sheep. Industrially produced trans fat is also called industrially produced trans fatty acids by hydrogenation of vegetable oils to make them more soft. It is commonly found in packaged foods, baked goods, cooking oils and spreads. It is done to increase the shelf life of food items and for use as an adult trend as they are cheap. So health impact is increases the risk of heart disease and death. It is responsible for around 5 lakh premature deaths from the coronary heart disease each year globally. WHO on trans fatty acids called uh, for global elimination of industrially produced trans fat by 2023. Uh, it established specific criteria to follow best practices in trans fat elimination policies and limit industrially produced trans fat in all settings. So there are two best practice policy alternatives that is mandatory national limit of 2 grams of industrially produced trans fat per 100 grams of total food fat in all foods, mandatory national ban on the production or use of partially hydrogenated oils as an ingredient in all foods. India is among the top implementers in the middle income countries category. India and PFA, Food Safety and Standards Authority of uh, India monitors the trans fatty acids in um, food products and it has capped the amount of TFA in food products to be 2% from 2022. Constitution Literate District Column in Kerala is India's first constitution literate district. So this is the Kollam district in Kerala and it is India's first constitution literate district. The citizen is a constitution literacy campaign jointly launched by uh, this is the, the the campaign was the citizen it is a constitution literacy campaign jointly launched by Kollam district panchayat district planning committee and the kerala institute of local administration so this ambitious campaign of citizen involved 2200 trainers called senators they visited schools offices auto stands and tribal councils to spread the awareness about constitution so around 16.3 lakh people in the district about the age of 10 have been educated on various aspects of constitution. The preamble of the constitution has been dispersed in all households and installed at schools and institutions and this will be officially declared India's first constitution by the Chief Minister of Kerala. Age report of 2020 and 21. The Union Ministry of Education recently released the data from All India Survey on Higher Education 2020-21. Uh, the ministry has been conducting this ish since 2011. It covers all higher educational institutions located in the Indian Territory imparting higher education in the country. And this uh, collect detailed information on student enrollment, teachers data, infrastructural information and financial information. So for the first time in age 2020-21, uh, higher educational institutions have filled data using entirely online data collection platform through web data capture format and that is DCF. It was developed by the Department of Higher Education through the National Informatics Center. So the findings is the total en enrollment in higher education has increased to nearly 4.414 crore in 2020-21 from 3.85 crore in 2019-20. and 20. The female enrollment has increased from 2 to 2.01 crore from 1.88 crore in 2019-20. There has been notable increase of 1.9 points 
observed in GAR of ST students in 2020-21 as compared to 2019-20. So the female GER has overtaken the male GER since 2017 and 18. The gender parity index, the ratio of female GER to male GER has increased from 1 to 1.105. The institutes of national importance have almost doubled from 75 to 149. The highest number of universities is in Rajasthan, which is 92, then Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat. So out of the total number of faculties, about 57% are male and 42 are female. A female per 100 male faculty has improved 75 uh, from uh, 74 and 63. Living will. So euthanasia, it reflects to the practice of an individual deliberately ending their life, oftentimes to get relief from an incurable condition or intolerable pain and suffering. Euthanasia, which can be administered only by a physician, can be either passive or active. Active euthanasia involves an active intervention to end a person's life with substances or external force such as administering a lethal injection. Passive euthanasia refers to withdrawing life support or treatment. The that is essential to keep a terminally uh, ill person alive. Legalization. Passive euthanasia was legalized uh, in India by Supreme Court in 2018 contingent upon the person having a level, living will. The Apex Court had held that the right to die with dignity as part of the fundamental right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution. Living Will A living will is a written document that specifies what action should be taken if the person is unable to make their own medical decisions in the future. And in case a person does not have a living will, members of their family can make a plea before the High Court to seek permission for passive euthanasia. So marriage laws in India are governed by different ways. That is the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act aims to eradicate child marriage. The center enacted the act by replacing the earlier legislation of Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929. Punishment is if a person performs, conducts, directs or abets any child marriage, he shall be punishable with rigorous imprisonment for two years or with fine, which may extend to one lakh or more. Both when marriage is null and void, where a minor is taken or enticed out of the custody of the legal guardian, when a minor is compelled by any deceitful means to go from any place, if a minor is sold for purpose of marriage and go through a form of marriage, if a minor is married after which the minor is sold off or trafficked or used for Im immoral purpose. The Supreme Court announced that it would examine whether minor girls as young as 15 years can marry on the basis of custom or personal law. So the legal age for marrying in India is 18 years for women and 21 for men. Marriage below this age is considered to be child marriage and hence an offence. In 2017, the Supreme Court ruled that sexual intercourse between a man and his wife who is below 18 years is rape, reading down section 375 rape of the IPC or the Indian Penal Code. Increasing legal age to 21, the Prohibition of Child Marriage Amendment Bill 2021 has sought to amend the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act 2006 to increase the minimum age of marriage for women from 18 to 21 years. So in December 2021, it was referred to a Parliamentary Standing Committee for further deliberation and it has already got three extensions to submit its report, the last being October 2022. So the legal age in uh, different faiths, the minimum age of marriage for a man is 21 years and for women is 18 years in the following acts of different faiths, that is Indian Christian Marriage Act of 1872. Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act of 1936, Special Marriage Act of 1954, Hindu Marriage Act of 1955. So under the Muslim Personal Law in India, persons who have attained puberty are eligible to get married. That is on attaining the age of 15 years when uh, they are still minor according to the Indian law. In December 2022, the National Commission for Women filed a petition in the Supreme Court to make the minimum age of Muslim women at par with other faiths. NCW had raised the question whether personal law could override statutory provision of the Pop Show Act and other laws. So thank you and uh, we will continue in the next session with part 2 of GS2 syllabus. Thank you and have a great day.